Okay, hello, and welcome to our talk on the Balance Council. So if you don't know, recently CDPR has released the Balance Council uh, as a feature to Gwent. This is going to be how we balance the game uh, over time. Uh, since there won't be any active development from CDPR, the community will instead balance the game. And uh, you can access this today in game. And the way that, that you do it is just from the main menu, you go to Balance Council. Now, each cycle, and I think there's going to be a cycle every 15 days, every player gets to vote for um, 12 changes. Three power buffs, three power nerfs, as in, sorry. You get to change the power of three cards by plus one. You get to change the, the power of three cards by minus one. And then you get to increase the provision of three cards by one and decrease the provision cost of three cards by one. Uh, everybody, there's no minimum amount required to vote, but everybody gets a maximum of 12. Afterwards, uh, at the end of the cycle, all the votes are tallied and the cards with the most votes get the changes. There is a minimum number of votes required for a change to happen, and that is 50. So unless 50 people vote with you to make Treyhern, you know, four provisions, it's not happening. Um, Minimum changes per bracket. And they're saying that uh, there will be a, at least 12 changes in each match, so three for each category. And there will be a max of 15 per bracket, um, which is 60 total. So in total, you could have 60 cards in Gwent, get either a plus one or minus one power or provision each time uh, the, the voting is concluded. Who can vote? Uh, to be able to vote, you have to be at least Prestige 1. You can see this in your profile. Or, sorry, and you, you either have to have 125 games this season or have reached rank 0. Either one. So I assume that means that if you were in the top 500 in pro rank uh, and you didn't have to like play placements again, uh, you can vote like just, you know, easily. So it says once a month. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure. I think maybe at the start they're doing it more rapid and then eventually it will be once a month. Uh, you can see in game when the vote ends. So right now it says voting closes in seven days and 11 hours. So you still have time. <clears throat> okay. So this is like the mechanics of how you vote. You can like drag and drop cards. Um, you can filter by provisions. Uh, you can uh, pick something to be your number one vote or your number two vote. So the way that matters is each player gets to put three stars on, on the first item, two stars on the next, and one star on, on the third. Each star is basically one vote. So if it could be that like you and 25 other people voted for Unseen Elder to get plus one power, but that's only 25 votes if you all put it as your third choice. If you all put it as your first choice, then that's 75 votes. So that's above the minimum threshold of 50, right? So in other words, you have six stars to assign in each category and the first one gets three, two, one, and each star is a vote. Uh, it's the same for all the categories. Um, once you've selected the cards you wanna pick, you just click submit and then it says your votes are submitted. Uh, be careful though, when you're typing, like if you hit spacebar, it says your votes are in, but from what I've seen, I'm guessing, based on the fact that it happened to me at least, um, you can just change your vote anytime until the voting ends, on the, until the voting closes. So if you made a mistake, just come back here and fix it. Um, the rest of it's pretty, like if you've used the deck builder, you should be able to figure this out. Uh, you should, um, the only thing that's different is that you actually have leaders here. So leaders can, you can't increase the power of leaders, right? But what you can do is you can increase the provision uh, provisions that the leaders give you. However, keep in mind, for example, if you want to nerf Imperial Formation, don't put it in increased provisions. For a normal card, that's a nerf. For a leader card, that's a buff because that goes to 70. For leader cards, it's the amount of provisions it gives you as a bonus, right? Because you have 50 to start and then the leader gives you like 15 or something or 16 in this case. But like this shows you which leaders are uh, clearly Imba Imba because obviously congregates the best leader. It gives you 16 provisions. Um, 
Unfortunately, we cannot do any changes to how the cards work other than power and provision. Like maybe I think Dagon should have two armor but be six power. Nope. Can't do it. Cannot do it. Only CDPR can do that and CDPR is done making changes. This system will only work for power increase and decrease and provision increase and decrease. Obviously power increase and decrease only works on units. And of course, if you have um, a unit that's like at one power already, you can't decrease its power any further. There are some units for whom a power increase would be a nerf. Like for example, a Nilf Guardian Spy, right? Now I'm not suggesting that anybody do this. I'm not telling you to do this, but if you were to go and make, uh, you know, Joachim be like five power, that would be a nerf. Or again, I'm not telling you to do this. I didn't, don't blame me. But if you were to reduce the power of Reaver Hunters by one, they would no longer be able to spawn a base copy of themselves, literally being bricks that would play as a one for six. Uh, because set a spouse base power to one that's less than self. I think that's how it works. Because one less than one would be zero. So. Maybe that, I don't know what would happen if that. So so even for even though we would all love to know what happens if you put Reavers in the minus one power, like it could be, you know, unexpected things could happen. We don't know. It's unexplored territory, which is why the safe thing to do is to not vote for Reavers to lose one power. All right. So you might, the reason I'm making this video is that a lot of people have asked me how I'm voting and what they should vote and so on. And instead of giving you like my choices and telling you just vote what I think, I'm going to tell you how I decide what to vote. And then I will show you my vote as well, right? So I'm going to give you my criteria and then we're going to look at a couple examples of how that applies. And then I'll show you my votes and why I'm voting that way in case that helps you with your decision making. All right. So, have a presentation. <laughs> Here's my criteria. I'm going to judge it by three factors, every card. And these are listed in the order of importance. For me personally, I first, I look at impact first. What do I mean by impact? Uh, by impact, I mean, if I were to change this card by one power, would it suddenly become playable? Or would this really strong card suddenly be less strong? Or would it be a minor impact? Since I only get 12 things to vote on every month, I want my votes to have the most impact. Um, so I'm going to pick things where I think my plus one or minus one will go a long way. Um, what's an example of where that matters? Take Henselt, right? He's 13 provisions. He's a build around card, cornerstone of, sto cornerstone of stockpile. If you were to change him from three power to four power, that's pretty significant because now Junior can't destroy him using his order ability, right? And it's a 25% increase. Like uh, he will, because he already has one armor. So it would require a five removal to kill him, not a three, not a four removal. But if you change him from like 13 provisions to 12, meh, right? Like, yes, that deck will have one more provision but whether or not you play Henselt in your deck isn't based on, like, you're not going to be like, oh, at 13 provisions, it was worth it, but at 12, pass. Too expensive. I don't want to tutor my Foltus Pride and play it for 30 points with five leader charges. I don't want that. <laughs> right? Like, you're not going to make that decision based on 12 versus 13. Now, the overall deck might become less strong, but, like, uh, you know, but, but, Hensolt will not go from not played to played and vice versa, just off of one provision change. The power change might matter because if like the dominant matchups, uh, having one power will make it live. Because that's the difference between an, an alive dead and a, and a, and a dead Hensolt, sorry, an alive Hensolt and a dead Hensolt are quite far apart, right? But a Hensolt where you have to cut a 5P and fit in a 4P is not that different. So that's an example of impact. Um, 
Another example is cards that like spawn copies of themselves. For example, if we were to change the base power of Reavers from two to three, that's like an extra 60 points for a Reaver player, right? Because like not only are Reavers harder to kill now, every Reaver that spawns is three power, so on and so forth. Um, and are, you know, the ones that live because, because they have an extra power will do more damage, lead to more points. Um, another example of where points can matter is like removal thresholds. Like we talked about Hensel, but right now there's a lot of cards that are above six damage. You, generally speaking, outside of like COC and Heat Wave, if something is above six, it's it's not gonna die to one like bronze special or one bronze card. It usually takes a gold or or a lock or something to, to disable it, right? Like if somebody plays tier, you're not just gonna play um, a brawler. Oh wait. Um, <laughs> anyway, you get what I'm saying. Like uh, rebuke is five, right? Uh, and enslave is like six, and and assassination is six, and there's a lot of five and six, but there's not a lot of sevens. There's Rock Slide, which is eight. Uh, same with like Primordial Dow can play two Rock Rogers for eight. But yeah. And then there's like a threshold at nine power where if something is nine or bigger, um, you can use Geralt of Rivia on it, for example, right? So, for example, you might think that buffing Dagon from eight to nine might be a buff, but it might actually be a nerf. So... As you make these kinds of changes, try to think about the ramifications of the change beyond just, I'm, I want to buff this card. There are nuances and there's there's other things that would be affected by that. Um, something you can do is basically what I've been doing is I've just been asking other people, hey, what do you think about this change? Do you see any problems with this change? And I ask people to, to tell me what's a better change. And we've figured out a lot of things like we've, we've iterated a, a few times together with chat and arrived at a list that I'm fairly happy with okay so that's the impact justified um, how do I decide if, if a change is justified for me it's does this card currently play for more points than other similar cards of the same cost throughout the game so let's say um, Torres first form Torres typically plays for you know 15 or 16 points Plus, the spying that he gave the enemy units, which enables your Artad, that has a value. So it's like, I think you can say it's a 20 for 14. That's very strong, right? Yaga, on the other hand, does not play for that much on average. Or ever. <laughs> okay? So does Yaga deserve a buff? Absolutely. Yaga is terrible. Nobody plays it in a serious deck. It's just a waste of provisions. And it can brick. And it has a floor of one. Like, Torres doesn't have a floor of one. Torres has a floor of, like, eight or nine in the first form. And, yeah, similar. Like, eight or nine in the second form. Has a ceiling of a gajillion, right? Because a Torres can replay a Fakusia that you play from Artaud. That's... And, and res a Vigo. Like, that's a, that's a gajillion points. It's a scientific uh, amount. So... To me, those like, yes, Taurus is 14, Yaga is 12, but like they're in the same class. Um, or like Boholt. Boholt is better than Yaga. Is Boholt overpowered? No, not really. Um, what about Temple? Well, Temple compared to other 12 provision cards, you could argue plays for a lot more than, than, than those cards, right? So that deserves a nerf. However, you'll notice that I don't have Torres, Temple, or Yaga in my list of buffs or nerfs because even though they fit category number two, they never they never met my first criteria, which is impact. I just don't think that nerfing Taurus by one provision is gonna have a significant impact on the game. If I could like if I could change it like four four times, and you know, Taurus first form is now like, I don't know, 15 provision and one power baseline, okay. Yeah, that would have an impact. But I'm not going to dedicate the next like three months of voting cycles that I have to just that one card when there's a lot of other cards that with one change could, could be significantly impacted, right? Um, 
And then the final criteria is the meta. How will this affect the meta? So this one's the hardest one, but like you should ask yourself, um, let's take a, let's take a card like Cockatrice, right? Um, you may be asking yourself, what's a Cockatrice? I'll show you. Um, here it is. Deploy. Boost self by two for each adjacent beast. Predator. Also poison an enemy unit. This card is two power, four provision. Making it like three power would have an impact not just in the points being, you know, 50% more, but also because it's a predator, um, that also helps it, supposedly. Like you can poison a bigger unit. Instead of being able to poison stuff that's like five power or lower, it would be able to poison stuff that's six power or lower, which is a big difference because like lots of important cards are six power and this would let you poison that. Uh, <laughs> Not that you ever would anyway, but I'm just saying, this card would be impacted, would be significantly better. You might argue it's playable if there were other poisons and monsters, just it's hypothetical, okay? Bear with me. Um, but like, do we really need more poisons in the meta? Or does monsters really need poisons? Is that what it's missing? Are there Or are there bigger problems that you want to solve, right? Uh, maybe not the best example, but let's take hybrid. Yeah, there you go. Um, Hybrid is a card that's not played, right? Where is it? Can't even find it. Hybrid. Hybrid, go seek. There it is. Mostly because it has some overlap. Um, you could make this 5 power and it would be better. Because then it would have like a ceiling of 10 and a, and a floor of 5, right? Uh, and it's a beast, so maybe there's something with Werewolf. Alpha Werewolf, I don't know. But it's not played because why? Um, because this exists in Deathwish. So, <clears throat> maybe in an Arrakis deck, where you can destroy a unit, you could drop this as 10, right? Or in a Golden Necker Kiki Queen deck with from Dole Dulok. Like, ch giving this one more power or, or two would be good. Um, and it deserves it, surely, because it's never played. And it could become playable. But, is that really what, like... Is that going to affect how Deathwish plays? No. Is it going to affect how Arrakis plays? Not really. So even though it's a deserved nerf and will affect the playability of this card, sorry, a deserved buff, and it will affect the playability of this card, it's still not going to have a, a good impact on the meta compared to some of the other things that, that we may want to change, right? So let's look at some things that I personally considered. So the first card, uh, one of the first cards that came up in discussion about the power increase was ruined because we were looking at ways like how can I make this plus one actually be more than plus one? Well, in theory, you consume ruin multiple times in a round, like let's say four or five times. So this would be a five point buff to the card, right? So if normally this card plays as a 12 for nine, it would play as a as a um, 16 for nine. That's pretty good. Like 16 for nine is a good number, whereas 12 for 9 is like barely playable, right? Riptide is 12 for 8. That's a good card. 12 for 9 is meh. Oriana like will play for more than a lot of times will play for more than more than 15, right? Lots of 9 provision cards at T play are are more than 12. So it, it, in that sense, I I went through it and I thought about it and we talked about it and yes, it would be impactful. Because we said, you know, three to five times a game, you're going to consume this. That's three to five points on average. And that would be enough to push it over the edge and make it playable. Does it deserve it? Yes. No meta decks currently run Ruin. It, you haven't seen Ruin in a tournament. Probably ever. <laughs> That's not true. But like, it, you haven't seen it in any of the qualifiers, right? In the top 16 or top 64 that CDPR holds. Um, you probably don't see Ruin on the ladder at all. Um... And yeah, so it, it deserves a buff. It even, it recently got reworked and it got played still zero, even after like people tried it and then people were like, nope, still bad. So, Arachas, is that how you say it, Kiesti? <laughs> um, would buffing Ruin be good for the meta? Well, Deathwish is like so solid tier two or three right now. 
It's a good blue coin deck. Um, it's not dominant by any means. Uh, but more importantly, Deathwish is very stale. There is one deck. It runs uh, Dagon, Bruis, you know, Heatwave, Arendite. It wants blue coin. It wants to play uh, Bru Bruis and use Urn of Shadows on it to, to thin four cards and get a lot of tempo. And then it runs out of steam, so it wants to pass. Usually if it can pa tempo pass at seven cards, it gets a bunch of Arendite ticks. It's very happy, right? And it has good short rounds with Succubus, Incubus, sorry, with Succubus, Detlaf, AQ. Like, that deck is solved. It exists. It's a deck. Nobody plays Haunt. Nobody plays uh, Rot Fiend. Nobody plays Slizzard. Those cards are not played, right? Well, Ruin shifts the value from Deathwish to a Consume. With every Consume that Ruin does, it gives you plus four or plus three or hopefully soon, plus four points. That means that instead of valuing really good Deathwish cards like Succubus, you'd value really good Consume cards like Slizzard. And you might look for ways to make them stick. It would be an indirect buff to Barbagazi, technically, because that's two Consumes. Or to Barguest, which no one ever sees play. Or to Haunt, because Haunt gives you two Consume cards and three Consumes total, right? Uh, so... A lot of cards within that archetype that are currently like B tier that don't see play, you'd have a, a bit more of a reason to play them if you're running Ruin. Um, you may decide you don't want to run that laugh, right? And that might open up provisions for something else. Like, um, so I personally think that would be a good change for the meta. The other thing about it is that. Ruin is nine provisions. Right now, if you want to play a Golden Neck or Deathwish, you're really just, all you have is Succubus. There's no Death Laugh, there's no AQ. And that's just not enough power, right? So you end up with a bunch of like, you, you run unicorns and and like maybe the the three trolls that are 7P, or, not trolls, the, the, the three relic ladies or whatever. Uh, it just doesn't feel good. There's no cornerstone to that deck, right? Lusty, maybe she troll, etc. So, a buff to ruin might make Golden Necker uh, Deathwish more viable, which is something you don't see. Um, or there might be things in Insectoids, right, with Ran Warrior and Stalker, because Ruin is actually an Insectoid. You may not realize it. So, you could put it on the same row as a Kiki Queen, and it gets buffed. Um, I see somebody from chat sharing their Ruin deck. Fantastic! I'll check it out after this video. Um, it's an insectoid, right? So um, it doesn't get spawned, so it doesn't interact with uh, stalkers. But it does interact with Kiki Queen, and uh, it would give armor to the to the Kiki worker because it's in, uh, the first time you play it anyway. <laughs> Um, and because, like, in Arrakis, you can you have an easy way to spawn tokens for it to consume, uh, it wouldn't be eating something you don't want consumed, right? Anyway, that my personal bias is that I feel like the Gwent games that I play have become, let me play my point slam cards that you can't in any way threaten or disable, and you play your point slam cards or your control cards, uh, that I can't interact with in any way. I want to see more engines and more decks, decks with mo more moving parts. I want to see combos. That's that's my bias. And that's kind of the direction that I vote, right? I don't like uninteractive. I don't like points lap. I think they're boring. I think mid range. Oh, this is good points for provision in a short round, medium round or long round. It plays for the same amount of points. I like cards that play for different amounts in different length rounds, right? I don't like Griffins. Griffins are the most boring card in the universe. It just comes out as a seven for, for, for five uh, when it's a fruit. Um, you know, if you res it, it's a nine and, and that's it. It doesn't do anything afterwards. It just sits there staring at you. Like a, I guess, a taxidermy Griffin. Whereas a Ruin, you know, it, it moves, it, it kidnaps children and, and we can all get behind that, right? Like it, it has creepy, creepy sounds it's got little sparkly bits and and look at this kid like going to sleep and not crying at all and keeping you up at night that's important we should support 
We should support Ruin in, 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 in the work that he does. It's important. Okay. So, what about another example? So, this is something else I was initially um, going to vote for, which is Knackers. For the same reason that I said I don't like Point Slam and I prefer, like, engines and moving parts, etc. You know, Necker is a card that, like, used to be playable, but it just hasn't been playable for a very long time, until recently, because of Ogre But it's, like, it's the kind of card that has monsters you can play, and it makes your opponent have to make a choice. Either they can use that turn to use removals to, 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 to take it out, or they can let it live, and then they'll, it will be a lot of points if the round goes long. A lot of times as monsters, when you're playing blue coin with some of the non-meta decks, kind of your problem is you don't want to use your win cons to win the round, but you also don't want the opponent to hang around forever and red coin abuse you. So putting some cards like Neckers down and having them stick would make it so that it's there's like a timer on the opponent because every turn that you play a unit that's bigger than the, 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 the Neckers, you get two points, right? It's like a two point per note. So if they're playing control cards and point slam cards to tempo ahead, but they're not playing engines, they will event you eventually fall behind and not be able to keep up with, you know, your, like if you could play Necker and Drowner and Bruxa and then play some other cards, like every turn you're getting one, two, three, four points. Um, so that was my thinking. The other part was that, um, like, just the amount of incidental damage in the game has gone up over time. Between Cataclysm, and Herald Pings, and Boats, and, and uh, Pikemen, and Arbalest, and Onagers, and, and, you know, there's just so much random, and Weather, and Tempest, there's just so much damage going everywhere, that, like, putting two baby Neckers naked, wearing nothing but a loincloth out into the wilds, and expecting them to survive is just foolish. You know? Like, they need some protection. And I would rather give them one armor each, because, I mean, they're ogres. They should have thick skin, right? But we can't do that. So I'd said, let's give them one power. And would it be impactful? Yes. Absolutely. Why? First of all, it spawns a copy. So there would be... Uh, one power buff would actually be two powers. Right? Um, and, and it would be, like... Rain can kill... Like, if somebody has a Hafru on board, you literally can't play Necker. Because you play Necker, they click the Hoffru, both your Neckers die. But if they were two power each, then that rain damage would just be, oh, I just thrive it back up, right? It's different. Or Archer kills them. Like, if some, if you play Necker, they play an Archer, bam, they get 10 points and you lose both engines. But at two power, they couldn't do those things. So there's a, there's a lot of things they can do one damage very easily, but two damage, they have to make a choice. So to me, like, having them at two power, they wouldn't accidentally die. They would require... The opponent actually like acknowledge the existence of these poor baby ogres who once again i repeat are out in the wild wearing nothing but a loincloth think of the neckers so that's why it's impactful and do they deserve it yes because they are children and children deserve the best um but mostly nobody played them and in ogreoids you really you put them in the deck because they have the tag but you're not happy about playing them. They come down for two tempo for crying out loud. Like you don't want to play cards for two tempo in Gwent. When when a four provision card on average plays for seven tempo, like two tempo, it's half of a squirrel. Like in a lot of matchups, you don't have time to play the squirrel round one, even if there's something in the graveyard you want to banish because you fall behind. But like half of a squirrel, come on, <laughs> right? So to in my view, it meets the impactful criteria and the deserved criteria. Um, not to, uh, and, and so then it comes to, is it something we need to do? Is it good for a healthy meta? Well, Thrive could surely use some love. You don't see Thrive much anymore. And Monster, you know, 4Ps and, and especially Neckers are just so easy to kill, uh, the ones that are engines, that they like just never see any play. Um, and it would be good to see more, you know, decks that can start slow and build up in a, in a long round one however ogroids are still pretty strong and this would be a a decent buff for them they already have really good tempo and on red coin ogroids are very good right because of the reach they have with king crumb and this kind of card like necker basically forces your opponent to 
overcommit from Bluecoin. So, uh, based on that and talking to, you know, just asking around, I decided that this would not be a good change. My personal bias, I want, you know, those 4P ogres that go to 10 when you drop them, if you have enough ogres in your hand, I want those to get nerfed. I want them to be nine power. I know that would deny might. I know that. But Ice Giant is 5P and it's seven. <laughs> Why is a 4P playing for not, for 10? And also it would make the whole incubusing out a 4P unit that's actually 10 power less powerful. Like to me, incubusing, uh, incubus on a fiend or a necker warrior is like where that card should be. And it, it, that's fair. But when you incubus and incubusing out a Griffin is fine because the Griffin, you have to play it for seven points earlier in an earlier round. But when you incubus out a 10 power ogre, that's just silly. Like that's too much. So, but because I can't, make sure that that change happens and this at the same time i'm not voting for this does that make sense okay so here's how i'm actually voting um i, I mean I, I still i still have a week to change my mind but this is how my votes currently go um so for one power oh yeah i was gonna put some reasons in this slide but i've you know, ran out of time or forgot. So I'm voting. Uh, in fact, I'll just switch to my screen to show you. Um, Ruin, for all the reasons we talked about. I took out Necker. I put in Hafru Singer. Why? Well, Hafru Singer is a very good card. Can play for a lot of points, but it's so easy to kill. Because of that, it's really not worth playing at the moment. Nobody puts this in their uh, Alchemy decks or their... Uh, Hashtag of Fury decks or anything. Um, I think it would be too strong at four provisions, but at five power, I'm hoping that it will have the same effect that uh, when the, the the Harmony Dryad, the the four power ones, or the ones that come from Waters of Rockalon, when those went to five power, like when you drop those, it's like, opponent has to ask himself, do I really want to use like an Alzer's Thunder or a Parasite to kill this? Not like, no, but also I want it to die. So it's like, it makes it a bit more expensive to remove and more likely to get value. Increases the floor of the card without changing the ceiling. Um, it, so that's that's sort of like the impact of it. Does it deserve it? Yeah, I mean, you, you never see this card played and it would be cool if it got played more. I mean, sometimes it gets played from Diplo, but like that's it, <laughs> uh, or Ruin Mage. In terms of the meta, what decks work well with this? Well, Alchemy, which they've been trying to buff, but still isn't very strong because it's kind of a solitaire deck, um, or has like a one trick. It's like Getty and, uh, you know, spam Crow Clan Druids and play Alchemy cards and, or play Ale and, you know, spam Froth and Truffle and Dwim. And like, to me, that's so boring. It's, it's not that bad. Like, and like when you drop a, a Gettyneth and then you use Oatkill to, to play like two or three Freya's Blessings from the graveyard, it's, it's really fun. But it's like all fun on your side of the board. And there's not much interaction between your units. You just want to have as many Crow Clan Druids as possible and then play as many Alchemy cards as possible. It's That's it. But there's a lot of interesting cards in Skellige. There's cards like um, Hermit which damages the adjacent unit by one and heals himself by two. Heals, right? Not boost, right? There's Dire Bear, which stops boost, but not heals. There's Heimei Flaminica. There's um, that six provision card that can heal units by two, but can't boost them uh, and gets a charge every time an adjacent unit takes damage. There's a lot of cards in the four, five, six P for Skellige that like work off of damaging yourself or healing yourself and Alchemy has a passive that heals your damage unit, and a card like this could work well with them. A card like this also works well with Melusine, which we also don't see much at all in the meta. Now all we see is Foulblood and Sig uh, Sigvald and Knut. Melusine is like nowhere. No Ceres on crate, and uh, no, no Ceres Fearless, no Melusine. Well, guess what? This card works really well with Melusine, because Melusine damages your own units, and then you, you can have other ways of healing them so for those like 
Buffing Millicent by one power wouldn't do anything, but buffing this by one power helps it, helping it live, giving him another good 5p they can play. Other than just priests and veterans, like, I thought this might be interesting. And it would have, there would be some cross-pollination between alchemy, etc. So that's why I picked that in, in terms of the meta. My next change. I know, that's not a picture of me. I know it looks like me, but that's just Unseen Elder. Um... And he's true to his name because you've never seen him in pro rank. Literally invisible. <laughs> Why? Well, you drop this. Nilfgaard says, thank you. I'll take that. And yoinks it. And half the time they're devotion. And they just wreck your day. And you alt the four and you never play vampires again. <laughs> or you play it and it gets hit with a mastercrafted spear. Or you play it and it gets hit with a parasite. Or you play it and it gets muzzled. And... Like, even in a Sabbath deck, you don't, you, you almost like, do I, should I really play this? Is there something better I can play in my Sabbath Vampires deck than this? You know, <laughs> um, there was like a brief free period where it was played in Wild Hunt because like NR Knights was a big deal and NR in round one couldn't deal with it because they just absolutely refused to put a lock in their decks for reasons. <laughs> and the Aaron Knight wasn't a six power yet. So, but in general, he sees no play, and he's like a cornerstone gold in Vampires that's like good if left alone, but he's he never gets any more value than the turn you play. Like you play him and he dies, or you play him and it backfires because they yoinked it, or they put spying on it. Now they have three Unseen Elders, and you're just like, what am I doing here? So the impact is because it moves it above the 6-7 to seven threshold, and it's you know, a 15% boost in hit points or something, right? Um, but more importantly, it, it, it's the 6 to 7 barrier. And um, does it deserve it? Yes, it's seasonal play. Would it be good for the meta? Does the meta need this right now? Um, I think vampires are like a solid B tier deck right now. Like, they're playable, but you're going to struggle to get it to 2,500. And above that, you're just like, you're, you're really, you know, opponents have to screw up or you have to get really good matchups and, and get a lucky streak before you can climb. And I say this as someone who's played them every season. <laughs> so I love vampires, but they're just not that good at the moment. There's a reason you don't see it in, in any tournaments or any like no high level players like climbing with vamps. Uh, so they could use a little bit of love. And I think one power could do it. If you don't like this change, but you want to buff vampires, you could consider buffing Plumewords by 1p, make those cards playable. Uh, Puzzle suggested Protoflutter down by one provision, but I'm choosing to buff it by one power because I feel like this card should be playable. Uh, you know, Harold is uh, is playable, Alberon is playable. Um, you know, even Usurper is good. Unseen Elder is just like, what's up? All right, so those are my, those are my power increases. Um, what am I doing for uh, my power decreases? So number one is Nausicaa Sergeant. And I know some of you like this card, and who doesn't? It's beautiful. It, anytime after round one, you, you play it, and, you know, after you've lost round, you play it, and it comes down as a 10, 10 point column of titanium because it has two armor and if they if they don't kill it you can slave driver it for another one you can also play it off of vigo and and it because it plays battle prep it procs assimilate twice so vigo goes to four instead of three which is a big deal uh <laughs> you can use the battle prep that it gives you to boost something else you can play this off of vigo now you have a one power sergeant you can use that one power sergeant to, to, to use the battle prep on something else. And then your Taurus can replay your own sergeant that was a 1 and it becomes a 10. So your Taurus on deploy will go to 5, will go to 6 because it's Prox Assimilate, remember, twice. Uh, so your Taurus goes to 6 and your Nausicaa goes to 10. And it's like... So this, this gold that is an Assimilate engine that's going to boost every time he plays a card not from his starting deck... Has a 4 of 16? <laughs> Ramon and two sergeants in a 3 card round 3. If I have Regis and Morvud, 
right? And Heat Wave. Like, three ridiculously good cards in a short round. And I go against Ramon and two sergeants, it will be close. <laughs> it depends on how big my Regis and, and Morvan are. You know what I mean? Like, because he plays 34 cards and uh, 34 points and three cards. Like, I know Sergeant already got nerfed to 6P. They're still in every deck. Every archetype in Nilfgaard plays them. Even, even Mill and sometimes Cultists I've seen play Sergeants. And that's just silly. Sergeants should be excellent in a soldier deck. And I think as a 9 for 6 with battle prep, they are. Um, they should be playable in other decks. But not like, oh my god. Opponent played like a clown. He used all his provisions. And he used his battle stations. And and he, he played War Council and B uh, Bacala all round 1. But I still lose round three because sergeants. Especially since because of Calvi, like you, you can kind of rely on them to arrive in your hand for a short round three. You can't with Osrol, for example, right? So you may ask me if I think sergeants are so good, why only one power? Well, um, I think that it's very easy to over nerf this card. I think six provision is expensive. Um, especially for Nilfgaard. And, like, I want to nerf this in the most gentle way possible. If I could take away the battle prep and instead change Nausicaa Sergeant to boost self by 5 if you've lost around this game, I would. Right? So it doesn't proc assimilate and can't be used to protect engines. It would just be a point slam card. You know, bronzes shouldn't be point slam and, and protection and proc assimilate all in one. Like, gold's, like, Vigo and Brothens should be able to proc assimilate, create a card and play a card. Sergeants shouldn't. Slave Divers shouldn't. I don't think Bronzes should be able to create and play other cards. And I would argue that Slave Driver and a Scout being able to do that has been like the source of the most problems in the last year or so of Gwent. And they've needed many, many changes to try and keep their power in check. And they're still present and they're still using abuse decks. Scouts even got nerfed to 6P just recently. But well, we can't well, we can't make those kind of changes. All we can do is either make it 7 provisions or reduce it by one power. And I think 7 provisions is overkill. So this is the smallest nerf we can give it. We've given it a minus 1 power. The next card is Slave Driver. So why are we nerfing slave driver well for some of the reasons i already said it's over present right um and it, it kind of like right now as nilf guard player you play a light cap that's a very strong bronze it's a five provision bronze i you know we like that bronzes are strong we don't want to have uh n no good um we want bronzes to feel good i i think bronzes should feel good right but right now if you're like if you're playing against a, a Battle Stations Erendite player or a Maddox player and they drop one of these um, and you can't answer it, like they can play a Slave Driver and play another one. And now there's two of them. And that would be fine, except next round they can do it again. And in round three they can do it again because of Ramon. So it's like, or from Vigo or whatever. One Light Cav is bearable two light cap is oppressive two light cap every round or, or for two rounds is just unfun like and you can take their armor away and and their leader usually imperial formation or a sergeant can give him armor like but this card by itself isn't that op just like reavers by themselves aren't op at all you know um it's when they get a critical mass of them that it becomes a problem now, because of flanking, only the first two light cav, you know, do two damage a turn. The ones on the back row do one damage a turn. But even then, you can have up to four light cav on a board for round one and still make two more for round three. Like, and the reason for all that is Slave Driver. Now, I don't think the answer to everything that's strong is to say nerf, nerf, nerf. I think a better way for the game to be is trade-offs. You want to have an extra light cap that's an engine that's going to do two a turn that's a very good engine and it's damaged so it's even better than boost because it doesn't go tall and it provides removal value great 
you suffer a temporary loss in tempo. Just like when you play a squirrel, you you have a temporary loss in tempo because you played four. Well, it's not temporary. You you lose some tempo when you when you play a, a four uh, four power squirrel. There should be some cost to playing a slave driver on a light cap. Right now, slave driver is three. You hit the armor, and and you get a one power light cap that also does two damage. So that slave driver played for like six or seven points of tempo in the turn that you played it, and like, and it gave you an extra card and it proc to simulate like. And it possibly removed an opponent's key engine because now you can kill a four. So, um, again, I think at six provisions, this would be too expensive. It already got a one power nerf by CDPR from four to three, and that helped, but I think three to two would, would be better. Um, Magni is already two power. It's perfectly fine at five provisions. Uh, I see no reason why this can't be two. And then the, the Slave Driver Nausicaa combo, if both of these changes go through, is instead of being 10 points, it will be 8 points. It still ends up 8 for 5, and 2 Assimilate procs, still really good. You still want to copy your opponent's Slave Driver if you're Assimilate, right? Like it, Or play your own if you can. Uh, when you get one from Diplo, you'll be super happy. So, it, you know, like, basically, 8 plus 2 times the number of Assimilate engines that you have on the board is, I think, a very good amount for, for a 5 for Vision card. So the third, the third card that I have in my power reduction is Angus. Um, if you've played against Heist Elves, you probably know why this is painful. Some games or some decks, you have a way to kill this immediately and also kill Vanadane immediately and also kill Reordain immediately if they have it. And then they end up replaying a bunch of bronzes, and it's pain. You know, it's goes back and forth. They have good tempo. You you have you have a good deck. You know, mistakes matter, decisions matter, and you know that's how the round is decided or, or, or whatever. <clears throat> if you can't answer this, they will replay this. Like if all you have is like six damage, you do six damage to this. They replay it. It's back at seven. <laughs> You didn't draw your Riptide or Heat Wave or COC, you know? Uh, or you don't have Stefan and Vilga in round one as as uh, Assimilate. Like, it's just... It feels so bad because every time they replay it, the power of every Deadeye they're going to play, they're going to spawn or, or have appear in the game from that point on will go up by one. If they replay it three times, Deadeyes go to seven. Right? That means their leader charges are seven points each. Each waylay <laughs> becomes, you know, three points of damage and a seven point boost on his side. More like double that if there's a waylay, if there's a Vanadane alive. Um, the trap, instead of being 12 points, becomes 21 points. Uh, you know, it's just everything snowballs. And it's not that like on deploy this is overpowered or anything. I don't think this card is there's anything wrong with it, but nerfing heist by one provision wouldn't do anything. It would just mean like they cut some consistency, and then elves becomes even more high rolly, because like at this point elves are dependent on uh, heist. Like without it, there's just not. You can't play that I ambush. So there was a choice to either for me at least. Um, Try and make this easier to kill or make nerf make Vanadin easier to kill. Because I really want to target heist decks or, or or heist abuse against decks that can't immediately answer it or didn't draw it. I think it's better to nerf this by one power. Why? Well, Vanadin has some passive value. Like you want your Vanadin to live even if you don't have heist, right? Because every time you play Waylay, you get an extra extra dead eye. This card has zero value after deploy unless you're abusing it with heist. There's no value in it. Like once you it's just a deploy card. Well, I have to kill it if he has heist because otherwise he'll replay it and replay it and replay it. Um because you know, they're on four purifies cuz why not? <laughs> so, rather than nerfing Vanadane, which would be a nerf to any non-heist decks as well, um I'm choosing, I'm voting to nerf Angus by one power, um, which would be 
a small impact if you're not playing heist, but a sizable impact in terms of the opponent being able to answer your Angus and prevent you from replaying it if you're playing heist. Let me know what you think. There are other cards that were suggested here for decreasing in power, like Calvi and Torres and Artad and, and Sov and Svalblood. And, you know, I think a lot of those suggestions have merit. Um, I don't think that nerfing those by one power will have as much of an impact to my quality of, of en my enjoyment of my ladder games as this would. Because, like, you can't really build your entire deck around answering two seven plus power cards in round one. So, every, like, 15 games or so, I run into an Elves player, and if I can't answer it, I, the round one, like, I just, I don't, I don't want to play anymore. <laughs> and you don't want to, like, make your deck target this one, because you don't need those two things against every deck, just this one deck. And not every deck can easily fit that kind of removal that, and make it available round one, you know? Uh, so, to me, like, I can deal with our Todd having a stupid amount of points in other ways. But if I don't kill this and he replays it, the game is done. It doesn't matter what else I do. If they replay Vanadane three times, I can still bleed the Simless. I can still win that game. If they replay this three times, there's nothing I can do. Because when I bleed him, he can use his leader charges or his like 4P bronze that spawns away late or his trap or whatever. And, and only spend exactly the amount required to get ahead. Whereas Simless always plays all your waylays. So to me... Multiple Angus getting played is a lot more deadly than mu multiple Vanadin getting played. Even though the Vanadin may be more points, you can bleed it out. You can bleed out the Simless. You cannot bleed out. Like once this has been replayed, there's no going back. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about the provision changes. Care Trolled is number one on my list. This is a ridiculously strong card. It's so good people are playing it in Alchemy. <laughs> like, like, Alchemy has nothing to do with any of this. At all. And that's always a sign. You know, when cultists were running spotters, you knew that card was busted. And when Alchemy is running Care Troll, you're just like, okay. Like, this card needs a nerf. <laughs> Why is it so good? It's just six armor, blah, 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 and a, and a bronze. First of all, you can play this on a dry pass because the, the deploy gives you a unit. You can't play Novigrad on a dry pass or Candle, but this card, yes, you can play it on a dry pass, right? The order is really good because you can combo it with any other removal, and especially in Patch of Fury where they can create a 13 power token from their leader at any time. It means that they can like, you know, purify your defender and then clash their Arniel with like, your you know game winning condition that you've protected and and worked so hard to bring to bear in round three which just just like that like they can just remove it they don't even need to use like a heat wave or something they can use a peller and click the order on this after using the like it's too easy uh because a, a clash is really powerful clash clash lets you take two units and and hit them with each other like so if you have a tall unit if you have like an old geared, that's 10 power, you can kill anything that's 10 or lower. Now, if it's not old geared of Sigvault, your unit will also take damage. Well, this thing gives them six armor to protect them. I would love if I could switch the order and deploy and take the armor off of this. I think it'd still be a good card, but you can't. So all we can do is give it one more provision. It might still be too strong, but it's the least we can do. This card is like stupid with 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 Sigvald, stupid with with Draco Turtle. It's stupid with Arniolf. It's just, I mean, please nerf this. <laughs> Battle stations, play two cards and draw two cards. Basically, it's two dandelions in one plus two thinning, like, and lets you deploy two engines at the same turn. It it, it is in every Nilfgaard deck. With the exception of Enslaved 6 because, uh, and even Enslaved 6 some people play it because some of the high end golds are so good or Angolim is so good because like you want to play Angolim so you can play your own care trolled so you don't have room for battle stations. Like <laughs> once we nerf this if, this, like if this gets to like 12 provisions or 13 or whatever it takes for this to stop being in every Skellige deck, 
we might see less Angolims in, in Slave 6, which means they might start playing Battle Stations, so we better nerf Battle Stations too. Also, it's oppressive in Soldiers, it's oppressive in Madoc, it's oppressive in Cultists, even though Cultists got nerfed. It... All British plays this, like, everything plays this. This is the best card in the game. If this was a neutral, it would be in every deck. This is like Amphibia... <laughs> this is like, um... Oniromancy, but twice in one turn, kind of. Not really, but... I don't know. My point is, it, it's a ridiculous card. Okay? So, nerf this. And I don't think anybody... Just, this is not a hot take. It's not controversial. Nerf it. It was 10. We thought, what the hell are they thinking? And even CDPR thought, what were we thinking? Let's nerf it by one provision. Which did absolutely nothing, because Soldiers X have provisions to spare, and at 11, it's still way worth it. This could be 13, and I'd still consider playing it. Yeah, absolutely. Chat says the same thing. This could be 13 and, and, and it's C play. Absolutely. On your man's ECs play, and that just plays one card. This thing plays two cards and draws two cards. What are you talking about? If I could play a Necrat and a Fletter in the same turn, I play Renfree just to do that. I make sure my deck has no, no units, and then I play Rune Mage, and then I play Renfree, and, and try after spending all my leader charges, try to get Sloth, play a Bronze Draw card of my top three. This thing... Especially with like War Council Synergy or Calvite, like you know what you're getting, or Marines, which can put whatever you want on top of the deck. This card is insane. Okay. Number three on my list of provision nerfs. The Imperial Marine. Can you guys believe this came out as four provisions? I can't believe. I remember when Lemon was doing a reveal on this and I was watching it. I didn't even think how strong this would be this would end up being this was so good that that it got nerfed to five provisions and it's still in every single uh, nilf guard deck this is one of those cards that if you can't kill it the turn that it's played you probably lose the round unless you have a tall punish but like you're trading a coc or a heat wave with a five provision soldier that they can copy with ramon and slave drivers and vigo Who's winning that game? Who's who's winning that trade at least, right? This card is like a piggy, the relic piggy that boosts two per turn without the Sabbath requirement. And also a Fisher King, <laughs> right? Because Fisher King puts one card on top of your deck. This puts a card, this moves a card towards the top of your deck. And once it does that, once it reaches the top, it just gives you two points a turn. Bam, 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 bam. I think everyone agrees this card is OP. So the only thing to talk about here is why am I picking a provision nerf over a power nerf? My perspective as someone who's not a pro player, right? I'm like top 200. Um, it, is that in a lot of my games, when my opponent as Nilfgaard has this in round one and they play Calvi, if I don't immediately answer, like, both Marines or however many Marines they play, and I run, like, Toad and Riptide and, you know, Cyclops and, and like, whatever I can and lock. If I don't answer them, I'm losing the round. And if they're on Red Coin, I might even lose it on even if I'm not careful, you know? And I tend to play, like, very tempo-heavy decks. The fact that this like five provision card demands an answer or it will get 15 to 20 points in the round is silly. The fact that on top of that, it can be used to make your deck more consistent is extra silly, right? And then the fact that you can copy this and play multiple, ver you know, like the only way monsters can copy Piggy is like Karanthir and Megascope. Both of those have easy ways to like prevent, I guess, or high cost. <laughs> Cranthier is like, if Vigo, using Cranthier to spawn a one power copy of Bronze, is if Vigo was uh, was not an engine, didn't have an assimilate tag, and only spawned the unit and didn't let you play it, so you wouldn't get an assimilate tag. That's what Cranthier on a Piggy is. Not to mention Piggy requires Sabbath, so it can be like, you know, disrupted. This doesn't. This, this can be like sitting next to an artifact and it will boost. <laughs> so... Um, now, nerfing this to six provisions, I think that would be too much. And also, like, I just don't think that every good bronze should be six provisions. Like, five P bronzes should be good. They should be playable. You, Sorry. Oof. 
I don't. What I'm trying to say is, I don't like making the six provisions. But without changing its ability, we don't have a good way to nerf it. If you make this three power, okay. Instead of sixteen points, it played for fifteen points. I am not concerned with the floor of this card. And I want this card to remain useful as a consistency tool because I think CDPR partly made this card to make to let Nilfgaard play non Calvi decks more effectively. Like I use this in in a in a soldier's deck that doesn't run Calvi as a way to make sure I draw my battle station or in a construct deck to make sure I get my Dow before I get my my rock barrages or whatever, or to put a blight maker on top. Like you know, this this can be a good utility card. I wish that it didn't boost so that it was like your opponent can choose to kill your Fisher King engine thing to stop it, but then they use a removal on it. Instead, though, this has become a points per turn, and because it has flanking, it's two points per turn, and it just like it gets it runs away, and it, so it's kind of oppressive. If I could change the ability of the card, I'd make it four provisions and I'd make it only move a card to the top. And when it finishes, then do nothing. Who cares? Like, it put that card on top. Or maybe only boost when it's moving the card up. So you could decide, you could pick a card that's already near the top. And then it wouldn't, like, it wouldn't boost anymore. Uh, but if you pick a card that you know isn't near the top, then it would boost a bit. And so in a Calvite deck, you would, like, Maybe pick something that you want to play, but it's like a sergeant, so it's like five cards down. I don't know. There could be some cool things you could do with that. I would rather make, like, Nilfgaard have more four and five P playable bronzes and not be forced to play six P bronzes because these things compete with with uh, tactics and, and, and other fun cards. But... We can't. So our choices are reduce its power by one and like if you reduce its power by one first of all imperial formation can give it armor anyway it doesn't really do much uh because you still need six removal and also when ramon plays it it still starts at four plus two armor and then it could boost to six with two armor and you're not removing it with anything other than the tall punish so i don't think reducing its power would do a lot it might matter in the scenario where you're creating one from vigo no it wouldn't even matter then because it starts at, at one power so, like, all these suggestions that people have about make it three power instead of four, I don't think would do anything uh, to the ceiling of the card or to the when you spawn one from Vigo or Slave Driver. Which is like most of these come from Slave Driver and Vigo. Only two are from hand, ever. But you can play two more from Slave Driver and one from Vigo. And Anyway. I think I'm rambling at this point. This card does too much, it's too strong, it's in every deck, nerf it. Yeah, uh, Hexon, Miyachi is messing with you. He doesn't think Treyhorn should be neutral. He wants Treyhorn nerf. Because he's not a monster. Or they're not a monster. Okay. <clears throat> I'm running out of steam here. Um, so I'll try and make this last part quick. Provisions decrease. My three choices are Indrago Larva, Parasite, and Imler. Put down the pitchforks. Hold on. Let me explain. I know that back in the before times, I was there. I remember Larva was five provisions. It was one power and had two armor. So it took the same amount of removal, but it had a lower floor. It would play for two more points. It was like Neckers with armor. Okay. And it was very good. Some would say it was one of the best bronzes or the best bronze in the game for a long time. And honestly, it was like a crutch that kept monsters playable for a long time, which was part of why monsters had a period where they languished. It was because, like, you had Larva. So every turn you had an extra two points, roughly, and so it masked a lot of other problems with the faction. It got reworked, I think, around Kashi time. I wasn't around for that. But it got changed to two power, one armor, and it got changed to six provisions. And for the last two years, I can't think of a time where people were unironically putting this in their deck and thinking, I'm getting good value for it. Even, even the Thrive, when they did the Thrive uh, 
card drop with the scenario and the damsel and the man trap and people were playing Kashi and Renfree. I played Kashi and Renfree to like 2550. People were like putting maybe one of these in the deck. This is like a cornerstone hallmark trademark like like this is about as as central a card as as light cav and crossbows are to soldiers what it was is even in thrive it's only getting one you know yeah like what are you more scared of in drago larva or reavers they're both six provisions although reavers came out as five what's more impactful in a short round in drago larva or sergeant even in a long round like this is probably like boosting to six so it's 12. Sergeant is 12, plus two armor, <laughs> you know, it's like, um, it's not 12 because of two armor, it's 12 because of the assimilate proc. Uh, usually, you have like two assimilate engines to benefit from it, or you're getting armor value, one or the other, in most matchups. Like, if, if your opponent has a lot of control and kills your assimilate engines, you, your armor gets value, and if you don't, then your assimilate gets value. At five provisions, would this be strong? Yes. Would it be too strong? I don't think so. I think it would be like if you compare it to the to the average top tier five provision bronze. So things like the range Corsair or Light Cab or Slave Driver or um, what's a good like Scoyatel five P like Archer or. Um, Chariot, right? Chariot has a floor of seven. This would have a floor of four. Um, but go to six and then eight. And Chariot is like seven floor plus, you know, one armor per turn, which is usually one point a turn for the decks that play Chariot or can protect an engine. Like, um, what are some other good... Like, like Melee Boat, uh, you know, is, is, is very valuable. People play that card. Highland Warlord is five provisions. That card gets lots of play. And uh, Piggies in Relics. Like, what are you more scared of? A Piggy or one of these? Probably Piggy. Like, you kill the Piggy. This, you might kill one of them. And that's the thing. Like, if your opponent doesn't have a lot of removal, but they have enough to kill a three, then this gets half the value. So... I think this would be an impactful change. I think it's a deserved change. And I think it'd be good for the meta because, again, as a Monsters fan, for a long time now, CDPR has pushed cards into being played by only one archetype. All the Wild Hunt decks, or Wild Hunt cards are only played in Wild Hunt. Vampires only in Vampires. Deathwish only in Deathwish. And so it makes creative deck building very difficult when, like, this is not an ogre. Can't be in an ogreoid deck. Does not have ogre tag. This does not have nature tag. Can't be in a symbiosis deck. This does not have... You know... Stop it. Larva are from a time where cards could be good and useful in multiple archetypes and solid and all around without being flashy, you know, like Slave Driver and, and Scout, uh, without being, like, oppressive like Reavers. But not also being like useless point slam, you know, like the new Ogroids. This is a card that both players can interact with and has different values depending on the round length. And there's decisions involved in do I play it? Do I kill one? Do I kill both? What do I use to, to protect it? What do I use to, to kill? Like, there's that's fun. Plus, it'd be cool if I could play like Neckers and then play this to buff the Neckers. Yeah, we used to have a lot of cards like that. You used to play like Catacan in Deathwish because it had a Thrive. <laughs> or Catacan used to have a Thrive and a Deathwish, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> now it's just a vampire. Anyway, that's me. I want I want to be able to play Larva in more decks. I want to play, make decks that, that are hybrid, that are playable, that are decent. They don't have to be like the top of the meta. But like this enables a lot of other things. And right now, the six provision bronze space or the six provision space in monsters is just like so sad. Okay, like a lot of my, my suggestions, and I don't get time to talk about this during the video, but have to do with like when I'm deck building, 
It's never like, let me put in all the good cards. Usually your choices are like, in this provision range, what are my options, right? Like, what are your options if you're making a vampire deck? Well, Fletter. What else? Uh, Queen of the Night. What else? That's it. This is not a playable card. And that's it. Like, there's two cards that you can play. Because this is literally useless. Like, it boosts by one when you play Blood Moon or, or something, right? This you would never play in Vampires. This you would never play in Vampires. This you would never play in... Like, you have two cards that you can play. I would like that number to go to three. Same when I play a Frost deck. Which of these cards do you play in a Frost deck? Well, this one. Maybe sometimes this one. That's it. What about Death Wish? This one. That's it. That's what you play in Deathwish. Because this is not a playable card. And neither is this. Outside of maybe like B in metas that don't have Tall Punish. Because everybody's playing Devotion or something. Uh, <laughs> and you know, as, like there's some decent neutrals. So there's Dorgary. Sometimes Lemons is good. Sometimes Fisher King is good. If you're playing Renfrey, you can play this. But like, there's not a lot. It's also the same situation at 7. Like there's a lot of like, this is a good card. This is an okay card. And then nothing else here is, like, played. Except for these in a Relic deck. These four. But, the reason I went for a six is I think it's more impactful. So, um, anyway. Just, just keep in mind that me and my chat, we put a lot of thought into and debate and discussion over into, like, what to decrease our provision. And it may look like, oh, I'm buffing monsters and nerfing Nilfgaard. It, it's not. Like, um... We like I asked, hey, somebody give me a better better card to, to provision nerf or whatever. And uh, you know. So I think this would be good for the meta, and I think it would be fun to, to play ladder when there's more larva. Parasite. Now this one is probably the one that you were most like, what what is he thinking? Well, I have this like notion that for Gwent. For Archetype to be competitive in Gwent, it has to have uh, points, obviously. It has to have uh, control, and it has to have consistency. Monsters have very often had the points, but very rarely have they had the control, and oftentimes they lack consistency also. Like, the decks that you see actually played by monsters either play a bunch of neutrals so they can have consistency uh, or or Wild Hunt Frost because they got the reworked Gales and Naglefar and, you know, um, Wild Hunt Riders. Uh, so, you know, they got... And Naglefar is good in that deck. So, so they got some decent buffs that are consistency, but that was only for Wild Hunt. Because Gale doesn't work with any other cards. And it's also only Devotion. So, uh, Or they play Deathwish, where Bruis is like the archetype-specific consistency, where it pulls cards. But like that means every Deathwish deck has to run Bruis. And I think that monsters need more consistency. I also think monsters need more control. I think it would, it's good. I think the game is healthier when we, have, we don't have like, this is the dumb point slam faction. I think that's boring. It's good to have dumb point slam archetypes or like ogroids or like uh for example there's sk ogroids that lirio made right it's parasite of fury with a bunch of uh tall units and a tris but that also runs you know care trolled and runs gutting slash like there are some good control options in that deck if you look through the five provision space like when you're making a deck and you want a damage special and you want something better than a, than a 4p well, if you're Nilfgaard, you have Assassination and you have Code of Weapons. This is six, this is five, and a Clog. You know, this is uh, less if there's adjacent units, but oftentimes, like, you need to answer a thing that's first played. And also, you can put Spying next to stuff to do six damage. Northern Realms has Boiling Oil, and this has some cool things that you can, like, purify an immune unit or a Resilience or whatever. It's a Warfare card, so it triggers Resupply. Uh, Scoytail, you have Nature's Rebuke, which can boost Trian by two. Um, you can play these from Simless or Fav or whatever. Skellige has Stunning Blow, which does 5 or 7 if something has armor. And of course, if you played Highland Warlords, these go up. And also, these can create something. 
Similarly, Squiatel, they have backup plans, which do two plus whatever you spawn from it, which usually uh, there's almost always a damage choice. Um, same with Feral Bond. And then Syndicate, of course, has Payday, or they have Soul Mutagen, which can do four damage and then boost your unit or give you give you coins or whatever. Or they have this, which can do damage and put bounty. Like, everybody has something at five p provisions that can do damage, except monsters. It's just Pred Die. And no, this is not a control card. And neither is this. Oh, if you put nothing else on this row, in four turns, your card might die. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's too late. I need to attack something now. He played a Philippe. I need to kill it now. You know, like, before my entire, like, civilization crumbles. And you could say, oh, play Alzer's Thunder. But, like, again, everybody else can play Alzer's Thunder, too. But they also have faction-specific damage special at five. Monsters does not. Also, at six provisions, there's this called called Mastercrafted Spear. This is better than Parasite because it does not overkill. And the fact that you can't use this to boost your own unit isn't that big a deal because, like, you, if you're going to play a six for six, you need it to have removal value. You're not playing six for six just to boost your own unit because guess what? You could have just played a Swallow instead. Or if you're Nilfgaard, you just play Boohurt and boost your own unit by nine, okay? So, <clears throat> I think that this going to 5P would m give monsters a bit more control. Right now, this is only played in um, Arrakis. But it'd be great if, like, when you're playing against ogres, it's not just, oh, they have Riptide, Arandite, Heatwave. Two of which are neutral, right? It could also be... They could have Parasite. Or against Frost. I've won so many games off of Frost because, like, they already use their, their Toad or Phantom, where I know they don't play, like, Phantom. They play Riptide. They already use those two. And they have the one Bronze that can do two damage. They played around one. And I'm like, I can have a one power unit on my board. As long as there's something that's, like, a little taller than it. This one power unit is immortal. You can't touch it. <laughs> it's, like... Give us a... Again, if it was up to me... I would have preferred for this to stay at six provisions and make it so it gives you drones for overkill, just like natural selection. I thought that would have been a cool rework to give it some flavor and some benefit. But since we didn't get that, I don't want this just to be a worse Mastercrafted Spear that clogs your Naglfar. At least make it 5p to compensate. Also, give monsters some control. Monsters, rawr. <clears throat> I can't even, rawr. Monsters should be scary. <laughs> scary monster is a phrase. <laughs> like, look it up. Put it in Google Trends. It, th those words are usually used together. But in Gwent, monsters are like vegetables, man. We, I don't want it to be the plant faction. That's Scoyatel. Okay? <laughs> so, can, can we please give him, give give some fangs to the to the monster faction? You know, the scary beasts of... of, of you know, the conjunction of the spheres, the whole reason why we just have to exist, why we need superhumans like Geralt to fight the monsters. People, please. And finally, Imblerith, everyone's favorite meme. Draw a card, then discard a card. If the discard a card was a unit, boost still fights power. This is both power crept <laughs> and clunky. And it goes tall. So, like, and I mean, I used to play this when this was an 11 provision card and it was called Wispus Tribute, I think. <laughs> it, it was it was two power and I used it to consume an Egern and it would go to, uh, you know, 15 or, or whatever. <laughs> and I used to use it to like, to, you know, tempo or, or, or bleed opponents back in the Trinet days. Okay, but... Like, Triss Butterflies, you can pick any card in your deck and just put it in your hand and then shuffle something back into the deck. And Mata will draw the highest provision card. Like, Decree will just let you play any unit. This will draw the top card of your deck, and then you have to discard something. And if you discarded it, then it will boost self its power. So, like, if you use this on an Eager, it goes to 18 points. Giving Omega value to Spores. You know? Like... Or, or COC or whatever. Now, that's fine. You know, monsters, big big boys, vulnerable to Tall Punish, vulnerable to Geralt's. 
that's fine. But like, considering its value, uh, nine P is just too expensive. So, like I said earlier, I thought that monster consistency should should get buffed, and there's only two choices here that work across archetypes. There's Imlorith and there's Nagelfar. Uh, Nagelfar is better in uh, Wild Hunt than other decks, but in general, like Nagelfar is actually seeing play. Like so, some Ogroids deck play it, Ogroid decks play it. You play it in Golden Necker because you can actually get Golden Necker. Um, Osril is eight. Hungry. Um, but Imlorith sees like almost no play in competitive decks. None whatsoever. I can't remember the last time I saw Imlorith in somebody else's deck. I play it sometimes because I like I like to use this on a Fiend. And then I can Mamuna, same round. Or I can use this on a Morvud and play Osril, same round. So that like I, I'm like when I play Egrin and I let it sit in this in the graveyard, my opponent gets, you know, if, if I don't bleed, they, they with Os if I don't have Osril on two, they'll squirrel it. It's gone. Imlerith lets you like consume an eager and late in the round, you know, where, where its armor, lack of armor, isn't a liability as mu as much of a liability, and then, uh, you know, Osril the next turn, and usually late in round three, people don't hold on to a scroll, you know, so it gives that some flexibility. You can use it, like I said, with Mamuna. You, um, you can, you know, in a Kashi deck, you can use Fisher King to put something on top, and then draw with this, or you can. Use Nagelfar. You play a card, and then the other card you know you're drawing with Imlerith. And so you make sure you have something in your hand you can discard with Imlerith. So th there's a lot of cool things you can do with this card. It's just too expensive uh, for all the downsides that it has. So I think eight provisions would be a good change. Um, there's a comment that minus one doesn't seem to be enough, would not be enough. You, you're probably right. But I couldn't think of a better provision decrease that I wanted. Um, or a better way to give additional consistency. Like, th there's these thinners, like Wild Hunt Riders. If, but I don't think these should be 4P. Unless we do it for all the factions. And I don't think these should be 5 power, unless we do it for all the factions. That would take so many votes. Uh, also, like, it would improve the Oberon combo. Um, you know. And, like I said before, we want to make changes to cards that A, take, makes, that, makes that card playable. B, the card deserves it, and C, it would be a positive contribution to the meta. Uh, is there other other cards that deserve it? Sure. This card is trash. Even at 4P, I probably wouldn't play it. Okay. Well, even if we like make this four power and make it four provisions, yeah, then it will be playable. But like, what have we accomplished? It's just a drowner plus two points. Right? Like, are monsters different now because they have a drowner plus two points? No. But if Imlerith is like cheaper then more decks are playable and more decks can be consistent especially like devotion stuff uh which i know uh, some people really like but like the other thing about it like in renfrey this is also useful one of the few tools monsters have in renfrey like a lot of other factions have lots of choices in a renfrey deck monsters for consistency all they have is Imlorith and wild hunt riders which are terrible so <laughs> um because the condition is clunky so, these are my um, my votes. Uh, let me know what you think. Uh, let me know what you're voting on in the comments or in Discord. You know, uh, we have a Gwen chat channel. People are sharing their screenshots. Uh, and if you think there's something I've overlooked or want to know why I'm not considering something, let me know. And it doesn't have to be like it can be any faction. Uh, I did look through all the Syndicate cards. I did look through all the Skelly cards. There's just not a lot that's pressing. In, in some of the categories. In the provision increase and decrease, or, or like, there, there's a, there was a lot here that I could list that would be alternates to these, but there wasn't a lot in the power increase and there wasn't a lot in the provision decrease that I wanted to do. Shellshock said, for what it's worth, you sold me Parasite? That's awesome, man. I hope I hope a lot of you will vote for Parasite and Larva. Uh, Imlerith, it's my third choice. If you agree with me, vote for it. If you think of something better, let me know or vote for it. Um, these, I don't think anybody, I think everyone, everyone should vote to nerf these two, Care Troll and Battle Stations. And if you don't want to do it for me, do it for the players playing in Masters. I promise you, almost all of them will tell you these two cards are o o overpowered. Um, 
I hope everyone votes to make this six power because I think that would be a good change. It would make it less frustrating to play against. It's not needed for the top tier meta. Like elves are a faction, are, are an archetype. They have good and bad matchups and everybody knows how to play against them. But it matters for like the, the general ladder population where, where it's all closed deck list and you don't know what you're queuing into. Um, I hope you vote for Ruin. I think that would be cool change. I don't know that it will suddenly make Ruin good, but I think that it would be exciting and I love I would be looking for, like if I saw the patch notes and I saw that Ruin got changed, there's a bunch of decks I want to try and see how good I can make. Same with Unseen Elder, same with Hafru. Um uh you know. So cheers and thank you for watching.